like to welcome everybody to this SCS meet and greet for two of our uh, new faculty. I'm Jessica Hodgins. I'm faculty uh, in the uh, computer science department and robotics. I've been at CMU now for uh, about 20 years, which is kind of remarkable to think about. Uh, I work in computer animation, uh, simulation of humans. I'm interested in trying to understand uh, how people move and why they move in the ways that they do. So we're gonna uh, organize this by starting out with some short introductions about our two new faculty. And then we'll watch a video, uh, a short video of their work, and then we'll move to Q&A uh, with questions from the audience. Uh, so we have uh, two new faculty here. Uh, first, uh, Zach is coming to us from uh, an assistant professor role at Stanford, where he was for a couple of years. Uh, before that, he was a postdoc at Harvard, uh, and he got his PhD and other degrees from uh, Cornell. He started in September 2020, and he works in control and numerical and op optimization. So his lab, he and his students are interested in developing algorithms that reason about a robotics physics, its environment, its actuators, uh, with the goal of an, allowing it to move with agility and efficiency. Uh, and he works on a wide range of hardware, plat hardware platforms, including drones, legged robots, and probably most excitingly, uh, spacecraft. And Jun Yan is the other faculty member that we're introducing in today's session. Uh, he was born in Shanghai. He did his postdoc at MIT, his PhD at UC Berkeley, and his bachelor's at Shanghai. Uh, he also started in September 2020, uh, so both of them have been suffering through the pandemic and these odd circumstances as they've tried to ramp up as faculty. Uh, we, should, we should applaud you both for that. It's not an easy time. Uh, Jung Yan works at the intersection of computer graphics, computer vision, and machine learning, and his current research focuses on deep generative models for image and video synthesis and synthetic data generation for vision and robotics tasks. Uh, and he wants to help humans understand and to learn how to customize uh, deep networks more easily. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to our host uh, and we'll watch the uh, two pre-recorded videos of their research. Hi, I'm Zach Manchester. I'm a assistant professor in the Robotics Institute, and I'm uh, the PI of the Robotic Exploration Lab. And we work on, in my lab, uh, something called motion planning and control. And I like to think of this as the science of moving things. It's sort of how we get robots and, and other systems to do what we want uh, with algorithms and software. So to give you a little bit of an idea of why we work on this stuff and, and what it's all about, uh, I'd like to start out with one of my favorite robots, the Mars Curiosity rover. Curiosity has been on Mars for about eight and a half years in one of the harshest environments imaginable. And in that time, it's gone about 23 kilometers. This sounds kind of impressive until you divide those two numbers and see that that works out to about seven and a half meters per day. Um, why is this number so low, right? Um, the answer is that Curiosity is not very autonomous. In fact, it's not really autonomous at all. There's humans driving it back on Earth. And uh, so everything Curiosity does has to be analyzed, planned, and then um, commands sent up from the ground by, by controllers. And this leads to really high latency. And um, what my lab tries to do is, is make systems like this able to control their own motions and go where they need to go without human intervention. So to contrast with, with this sort of situation, I like to take a little bit of inspiration from nature. Uh, I love these videos of mountain goats. And, and what you should take away from this is these animals from a very young age are able to fully take advantage of their body's capabilities, their physical hardware, if you like, uh, and also exploit all the features in their environment on this rough terrain to move dynamically and uh, robustly and, and get where they want to go. Um, we, you know, in spite of what you may have seen from Boston Dynamics recently, uh, you know, I'd like to point out that's that's on flat ground in a controlled lab setting, right? It's nothing like this. 
Um, so to sort of show you some of where we're at with this sort of thing on robots, this is some work from my lab from a few years ago, um, showing planning on a dog-like robot called Little Dog. Uh, and you can see we get, get these things to climb stairs and um, the bottom right shows uh, limping when it's had a damaged leg. Um, so this, this looks really nice, right? It looks very animal-like, um, but the, the problem is that this stuff right now, these few seconds of, of motion you're seeing here took more than 30 minutes to plan offline. So we're nowhere near being able to do this stuff online on the robot in real time like those mountain goats you saw. So what we've been working on my lab for the last couple of years is trying to speed this up. Uh, so we've built uh, new algorithms. Uh, we have a custom solver for this kind of stuff we call Altro. And we're right now about one to two orders of magnitude faster than kind of the standard off the shelf solvers that people use for, for this stuff on a bunch of benchmark problems. So this is great, but we're still an order of magnitude or more too slow for the dog robot or the, or the mountain goat scenario that I showed you before. So we still have a lot of work to do. But this new solver technology has enabled a whole bunch of interesting applications in the meantime uh, that I'll kind of uh, tease a little bit. So uh, we do a lot of work on, on space applications in my lab. And uh, one area that's gotten really interesting recently is um, on-orbit servicing, so docking, proximity operations, trying to refuel satellites. So we do some work in that area. Uh, we also have a project with NASA to do trajectory planning and control for entry vehicles to land on Mars. And the challenge here is that you don't really know what's going on with the winds and you have a lot of uncertainty, but you still need to do a pinpoint landing and, and guarantee safety. So that's really challenging. Uh, we do some work in cooperative control. Uh, so in a multi-agent setting, we have multiple robots that need to collaborate and cooperate to uh, achieve a common goal. We can build algorithms that let the robots talk to each other and coordinate their motions like this. Uh, we also similarly work on what's called game theoretic planning. So this is uh, a multi-agent setting where you're not cooperating, where it could be adversarial. And it turns out this is directly ap applicable to autonomous driving, to things like uh, highway merging, where you're, you have to reason about what, you, what the other agents are doing, but you're not directly collaborating with them, right? Uh, we also do a lot of work on small satellites. So this is a, uh, what's called an attitude control problem. So pointing a small satellite, getting it to uh, slew around and point cameras at the ground, say, or antennas at a ground station. And we've actually built uh, three of these little satellites uh, one of my grad students actually built these in his kitchen over the last uh, couple of months because of COVID restrictions. And these are going to fly next week, fingers crossed, on a, on a SpaceX launch to demonstrate some of this stuff on orbit. The last thing I want to throw out there is that um, on, the, on the hardware side, on the space side in particular, we actually do a lot of uh, open source hardware development and, and outreach stuff on, on these small satellites. Um, all the hardware for those satellites has been open sourced. The designs are publicly available. The code's publicly available. And we've, we've had a lot of student groups at other universities actually build these things and use them in courses. And, um, and uh, it gives you the ability to put together a satellite for a few hundred dollars uh, and puts it in within reach for, for small student teams. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a brief overview of what we're all about in my lab. Hi, uh, this is uh, Junyan Zhu. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Computer Science with uh, Robotics Institute, as well as with Computer Science Department and Machine Learning Department. Uh, I'm, most, I'm working on uh, computer vision, uh, computer graphics, and machine learning. Uh, today, I'll like talk about some of our recent work on how to use AI uh, for create content uh, for both humans and machines. So people, humans have created various uh, content uh, uh, throughout history, from the ancient cave art uh, to Michelangelo sculptures uh, to, to the Impressionist painting. Uh, to more recently, we have uh, 3D computer graphics. Uh, this is one of my uh, favorite movie, uh, Life of Pi, which tells a story about a little boy with a giant uh, Bengal tiger. But who is creating uh, so much kind of exciting visual content. Uh, it turns out only a few chosen talents can do that, like the well-known uh, painters and sculptors, as well as award-winning film directors. Um, why is that? 
uh, because content creation is very uh, time consuming and expensive. For example, in the movie, uh, to to create this 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 video, uh, a professional visual artist to have to specify everything, uh, just correct from uh, the skeleton to to geometry, uh, to to texture, uh, to very small details like tigers' uh, furs, uh, to make an image look realistic. Uh, it, it took hundreds of artists, uh, twelve months, uh, sixty million dollars to to produce uh, such a, such a movie. Uh, well, what about the rest of us uh, who also have a story to tell, uh, who may not have sixty million dollars in hand? Uh, what can we do? Uh, so, so my my long term goal is to uh, help everyone uh, create visual content more easily. And and my my approach is to uh, use machine learning and AI to first teach machines how to create realistic content, and automatically, and human just does not have to create content by themselves. They just need to tell machines which kind of content they would like to have, and machines can fill in all the details. Um, some of our recent work includes uh, uh pix to pix, which is a method which can translate an image from from one domain like like this kind of sketch, uh, to a to a to a new domain like an image domain, and uh, one example of this application is actually that the online link is called Edge to Cast, uh, developed by our friends Chris. Here, a user can draw draw a cat and press the button. Uh, here is a, another cat, and and it's quite easy to use. You just draw something, uh, you press the button pro process, and it can. Uh, create a create a cat for you. Uh, here are more um, creative cats, crazy cats created by by the, our users. Honestly, I don't know how they how they do that. Uh, what is that import edge? Um, another system we have been working on is called Gaugan system. Uh, here the artist is demonstrating our system in front of five thousand audience in SIGGRAPH, and and the artist can specify uh, which which kind of objects they like to draw, like either a mountain. Or water, or maybe sand, and machines learn to automatically create this content in real time. And uh, here, uh, I, I just is adding some rocks uh, to make this seem more vivid. Uh, so everything is learning in real time, and we can add some cloud. Uh, uh, the, the interesting part is actually machine learns to uh, have a more foggy mountain here. Uh, it's learned from the the data by itself. Uh, and you can choose a particular uh, style, a real image, and apply the kind of the uh, style to to the, these particular generated images. So, given a single layout, you can generate uh, potentially unlimited number of images if you like. Uh, this this interface has been used by uh, several major uh, major uh, film film studios uh, for concept concept artists. By concept artists, the idea is you can quickly. Uh, before you are making a movie, right, you can quickly uh, realize your idea without going through the full three D modeling pipeline. Here, the artist can create a background and then add some new objects into it. Uh, our method can be generally used for improved realism of the CG rendering. Uh, this is useful for both computer graphics and also for robotics, because oftentimes you want to train a robot on a simulated environment. But you want to make sure your simulation is look realistic. Otherwise, it, the robot policy will not work for the real world scenario. So here is some here is a game, and and and, and we try to make it look like more like a cities in German. Uh, so here we take a bunch of street view images from German city, and try to make this game look more like a, a real world scenario. Uh, here is the import CG rendering uh, from the game. And we can then use our method to autom automatically um, synthesize all, all the details, which look like a, a German uh, cities. Uh, you can see these kind of like uh, kind of car symbols or you know, sponsored by any car companies. Uh, so in short, I think uh, different visual content creation uh, techniques were powered by underlying uh, software and hardware, right? From the Earth pigment. Uh, to modern computers and uh, rendering algorithms. Uh, so in, in our group, we are presenting a new idea, which is how we can use machine learning methods to autom automate it 
and to learn it, learn to create content from millions of billions of images. And this is complementary to other techniques. For example, you can use the you can use the strokes to create a draft, and machines can fill in the details. And and we we have been working on widely use of widely used general purpose algorithm. Uh, two of the paper has been cited by more than seven thousand times uh, in the past five years. Uh, and we are working on for humans. We are working on interactive tools for humans create content. So that's what we call it, create content for humans. But we're also working on create how to create automatic created content for for machines. How can we create training data for robotics, computer vision, and self-driving car applications? Uh, the idea is the machines can learn from our create environment and it can work better in uh, in the real world applications. Yes, thank you for for your attention. Uh, happy to uh, chat with you more later. I'd like to welcome everybody back. Uh, and this is now the time where you get to ask questions of these, uh, of our two new faculty members. Uh, we have a list of questions we can start out with, but you can also ask questions in the chat in the bottom of the webinar box. And I actually see that we do have one question already. So why don't we start with that? Uh, so Zach, the question uh, is, Zach, can we get an update on the SpaceX launch you mentioned, since I assume the video might have been recorded previously, and maybe the launch has actually happened? Yeah, uh, it did happen. So uh, those three satellites, they're, um, the mission's called V-REX. Uh, the, the satellites are named after the dinosaurs from the land before time. So they're Petrie and Sarah and who's the third one? I'm forgetting the third one now. Uh, so that's, um, they're on orbit. They're, they're running a, an experiment, a set of experiments to try to demonstrate um, swarming kind of capabilities for small satellites. Uh, so the, the main experiment on there is a relative navigation experiment where they're, um, they're talking to each other uh, with radios and measuring the time of flight of the radio signals between the three satellites which can get you uh, a range measurement between the three satellites. So just range alone doesn't give you the full relative pose, like relative positions of these, of these guys. So we have some, uh, some fancy algorithms to do that, to sort of reconstruct the full relative positions and do relative navigation just from those range measurements. So that's the experiment. Um, they, they launched, uh, when, when did they launch now? They, they launched, they've been on orbit for a couple of months now actually. And, um, uh, they, uh, the short story is they, they got deployed and we collected a whole bunch of this kind of ranging data right out the gate in the first week. Uh, and then we, we drained the batteries uh, by, by kind of running them full tilt. And they've been uh, essentially asleep for the last couple of weeks trying to recharge the batteries. So um, we, we basically checked all the mission success boxes for NASA and, and collected all the data we needed to do those navigation experiments. Um, but yeah, we're hoping to do some more fun things with them, uh, assuming they they sort of uh, charge up uh, and, and wake back up soon. So that's kind of where those are at. Do you have the ability to uh, check the charging or uh, are you just waiting? <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, so we, we ping them like once every few days and, and see how they're doing. Uh, but they're, they're kind of in a low power sleep mode right now where they don't, they don't do anything unless we send a signal up to, to wake them up basically. Oh, that's really exciting. Think of those things up there. <laughs> All right. Uh, so please do type in your questions. Uh, oh, we have another question. All right. Uh, this looks like it's directed probably at both of you. So why doesn't Juyan take the first crack at it? Uh, so educating the undergraduate and master's students is a big responsibility and opportunity. And what are you excited to do in this area? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm actually designing a new course on kind of image generation that's open to both undergrad and master students. Uh, I think I think the, the efforts are twofold. One is more like for for CMU students, and the other is for a broad audience. Uh, so for the CMU students, we are actually designing some kind of 
have new deep learning homework, which can people people can get their hands dirty on training these kind of generating models and how to create images, and they can use their own photos to to actually test their algorithm. I think we, we want to get them engaged. So we don't want to give them a pre pre set of in, in images. We want them to encourage them to try the algorithm, like tweak the algorithm on their own photos or their friends' photos. Uh, maybe you take a phone to capture some photos for the algorithm, and you can have some funny funny effects. Uh, also, I, I'm in my in my course, I also focus how how we can help people debug deep learning system. Is what happens if there are bugs? Uh, so I'm all, all, because I feel like there is a there are lack of this kind of um, courses on how how I, I think we know how to debug a C plus plus code. If something went wrong, and but there are not so much resources on how we teach the deep learning theory, but how deep learning algorithm, how about if you implement something which would go wrong, uh, what should you do? So I try to collect some samples, like what what will could happen, uh, what, what, how should it buy, encourage students to share their bugs in, with us, and I would like to document these bugs, and hopefully in the future. Um, it, it's easier for the future generation to to debug the system. What went went wrong? There might be some kind of kind of some kind of examples for them. And for for the broader audience, I'm also trying to open source the the course material, the lectures, and uh, homeworks to to the public, so more people can um, can can use it. Even they are not CMU students. Uh, I used to teach a course on Udacity, which has a um, very big audience, like 800 students, like for deep learning course. I found actually lots of students want to learn all these kind of techniques, but they may not be able to go to a very like top like university like CMU uh, or Berkeley. So uh, I found it's very useful to open source all the materials and assignments and uh, as much as possible uh, to, to the general audience who are interested in this topic. Yeah, that's it. Great. Uh, Zach, do you want to take a stab at that question? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I just started teaching, uh, and it's it's been interesting doing this all remotely. Um, so I'm I'm teaching a controls course, uh, like an optimal control class, uh, and I, I think uh, what I'm trying to do with it is take a, a more computer science viewpoint on control theory, which is typically you know sort of the the realm of like aerospace and mechanical uh, people. So it's uh, a lot more kind of like algorithmic and. Um, and I'm doing everything in Jupyter notebooks and, and trying to make it fun. So we have uh, like the homework problems are like make a robot a quadruped stand on one foot and balance and land a rocket and this kind of stuff. So that's super fun. I'm having a, a, a lot of fun with that. Um, and then uh, the other thing that I'm, I'm super interested in and have, have done some things with uh, that I've, I'm going to see how to get this ramped up at CMU now. It's, it's been tough with the pandemic stuff. Um, I love doing harbor projects with undergraduates in particular and, and um, satellite projects in particular. And so the, the three satellites that, that we have on orbit right now, they were basically built by one grad student in his kitchen over six months. Um, but um, I, I showed that in the video that the open source uh, avionics stack we have for, for these small satellites, it's all programmable in Python. And the intention of that was to open it up to undergraduates and make it easy for students to program these things and do experiments on them and, and actually work on satellite missions. Uh, we have another couple of satellites hopefully launching at the end of this year, at the end of 2021 or early 2022. And I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that we can get back on campus and actually get uh, a crew of undergrads involved in that. Right now, we have a couple of master's students who are, are gonna, I think, be sort of project leads, but um, I'm gonna try to recruit a whole bunch of undergrads to, to work on the satellite stuff. And, and I think um, that is, is one, of, one of the things I'm super passionate about, just getting more people involved, hands-on and that kind of stuff that, that feels like it's sort of the realm of only, you know, NASA and the, the government, and, but, but showing people, you know, no, you can do this. This is like, you know, it's tangible for, for undergrads. That's great. I hope we're back on campus soon so you can make that happen. Uh, or maybe maybe you need to make kids and everybody should be doing it in their kitchen. I don't know. Uh, so uh, we have a couple of questions, sort of more general questions that uh, were provided by the organizers. Uh, and I thought the first one might be interesting to have you answer. So you both work in fascinating areas, but they're also almost completely different. So the question is, uh, what inspired you to get involved in your specific research? Uh, one of you want to tackle that first? Um, I guess I, I can go. Uh, so I, I've been a space nerd since I was a little kid. 
Uh, I can't tell you when it started, and I don't know that my my parents could either. Uh, I I always loved you know anything space you know wanted to be an astronaut the whole deal, and I guess for me the you know, the path towards like being in a computer science you know sort of school in, in a robotics institute is, is the one that's maybe you know a little bit more circuitous. But uh, I, I've always been yeah super interested in space things, and then. Um, um, when I first got a chance to work on this stuff, uh, it was actually as, as an undergraduate, I was, I was a physics major. Um, there was a student project team, a satellite project team at, at Cornell when I was an undergrad. And it was one of the first, you know, uh, things like this, that um, it was is a very rare thing at that point. It's gotten more common. Um, but uh, that that was sort of, you know, I, I jumped at that opportunity and, and kind of never looked back and then kept kept doing this stuff ever since. Sweet. Leon, you want to uh, take a stab at that one? So what inspired you to get involved in your research? Yes, so for me, I, I think when I was a, when I was a child, I often like to, so I looked at lots of movies and cartoons. I also try to create that, but I don't have any uh, resources. The only resource I have is I have a, I have a piece of paper. I was supposed to for homework, but I, I use it for, I, I draw some cartoon or sketches and I try to, I try to draw each frame, frame by frame, actually. So, I, but I only have one paper. I erase them. I draw the next kind of bit of action. So, I try to help more people create like their stories. Uh, also, they also they may not have lots of uh, resources. They may not have a company working for them, but they can. Hopefully, they can one day they can uh, create a short movie, or maybe everyone can design a game uh, just by themselves with, without knowing. All, all, the, all, all the detail without have a, have a team, like a big team for them. So that's kind of my, kind of my initial kind of starting point. And then I, 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 I jump into graphics and then, then I realized maybe to make this everything automatic, we will also need to learn a little bit about machine learning and computer vision. That's why I, I also start working on machine learning and I, I talk to a computer vision faculty. Uh, so, that, so that's basically I want to use machine learning and computer vision to help uh, graphics for, for more people. That, that's how I started my research program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll move to another one of the questions that were provided by the organizer. Uh, this is probably one, uh, at least by at least senior faculty hate this question. So we'll see how you as junior faculty appreciate it. So that's, uh, what's one prediction that you have for some period of time uh, down in the in the future, so ten to twenty years uh, from now, uh, and I think probably it'd be most interesting to hear about your predictions for the uh, for your subfields. But uh, you can take it any direction that you'd like. And Zach, you want to go back and tackle this one first? <laughs> okay, I gotta think about this. Yeah, it's hard when you don't scope it at all. <laughs> it's like predict the future. Go. Um, uh, so the particular things I'm working on, that, so that there's kind of a couple things that I'm most, uh, they seem like super disparate and unrelated, but the, the two areas that I'm kind of most really interested in right now, one is legged locomotion uh, and, and trying to figure out how to make legged robots do awesome things in unstructured environments, how to like do the mountain goat thing. Um, and I, for me, that's like a, a just grand challenge. Uh, so I, I for, for, for in that particular area, you know, I want to, in 10 years, I hope we do have robots that look like those mountain goats that can sort of climb up, um, you know, rugged trails and this kind of stuff uh, and without, you know, knowing anything about the environment a priori. And so sort of the, the space nerd in me wants to, you know, send those to Mars and, uh, you know, have them run around and cover a lot more ground than our current uh, rovers can. Um, and then I guess on, on the space side of things, the, the thing there that I've been super passionate about for like the last 10 years that's really been driving me in that, that domain has been the, like lowering barriers to entry and making it cheaper and cheaper to, to put satellites up. The launch industry has come a long way in the last 10, 15 years, especially with SpaceX. And now there's um, Rocket Lab, another uh, uh, launch startup that's been really successful at building smaller launch vehicles that are much cheaper. So the cost of launching things have really come down on a, like a per kilogram basis. 
but it's still, uh, there's still huge barriers to entry. So um, kind of in that area, like the open source hardware stuff we do, it, it's a lot of that's oriented at just getting rid of those barriers for, especially for, for students and educational institutions and trying to make it so that uh, the, the, the cost of putting one of these things together is like on the order of a few hundred bucks or a thousand dollars, right? Like smartphone kind of prices. So there I'm, I'm hoping that we can, um, we can sort of get rid of a bunch of those barriers and make it possible so that pretty much anyone who wants to can, can fly a satellite. Yeah, it is amazing what's happened with the launch industry. I, I mean, I'm not in the field, but I don't think I ever would have predicted that that would uh, be democratized to the extent that it has been this quickly. So. Uh, Junyan, you want to take a crack at that one? Uh, making some wild predictions for the future that uh, we'll hold you accountable for later? <laughs> I don't know. I think maybe, uh, I, I guess I can predict what will not happen. Like, I think AGI will probably not be achieved within 10 or 20 years. Uh, I, I don't know what could happen. I think for me, I think maybe uh, I will be excited to, I think I would like to see is maybe in the future in 10 or 20 years, maybe everyone is watching a different movie or video. So this movie, you can specify the actors you like. So then I have to be the original actors. You can specify the city, the time, uh, maybe the different like other kind of aspects of the movie, or, or you can play a different game. Everyone is playing a different game but with different kind of appearance. Uh, so I think it will be customized content in terms of game videos and YouTube videos or movies. So I think that, that that would be very exciting to see and it, it can give us a recommendation of what kind of actors we like to see in the movie. Uh, so so I think everyone is watching a slightly different content, just like kind of the ads recommendation we have now and a bunch of other kind of book recommendation, like you're yeah, recommending different books to you maybe in the future we'll recommend uh, customized different content for you. So that's kind of my uh, kind of prediction, kind of bold prediction. I have, it's very hard to do with current technology, but maybe we'll see how it will look like. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a question for you, Jenyan. Uh Have you tested some of your generative graphics tools with novice artists, artists and how have they responded and used the tools? Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's a really good question. I, I, I think artists are actually often more, more creative with our tools than than they are ourselves. And I think, uh, we, we, I think a couple of like artists from different countries have used our our machine learning toolbox for the for the, either for the they are actually for the for the artworks they actually sold something, uh, like for maybe for forty k dollars, although we don't get anything. But I think it was okay. But also they used it for the, the art exhibition. One 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 kind of demo they uh, my favorite demo is they, they are the uh, demo which can turn your face into kind of vegetable uh, po portraits, and they actually set up this demo on on like uh, I guess on studio maybe before COVID, and people can jump come in and then try to show different expression and get their different vegetable portraits. So they actually put that. Uh, uh, on, on, on art exhibition. So I think we are working with them. I think that our goal is not to uh, restrict their use. Our, our goal is to make the software uh, as, as easy as possible to use, but they can use it for anything they like, but we try to make it interface. Uh, they, so, so they just need to provide the software to collection of images and we can do the transformation for them and they can tweak which collection they want. And also make the code easy to read and easy to actually a lot of artists know how to write deep learning code very very they are very good at that actually if you think about it and so we try to make it easy to use we also try to another thing we are trying to do is we try to make the training faster we try to make the training maybe maybe it don't used to take a month maybe can we make it the training take only take a day maybe it can only be done by like nvidia or DeepMind. can we make it happen like you can have a single GPU and train for several hours, you can get the same result. So I try to make the technology more accessible. Also try to make the testing more fast. Usually you need a high-end GPUs, but can we just use a de like a de desktop or laptop? I have my MacBook, could you run the same model and, and but 10 times, 100 times faster. So we're working on make the technology more accessible. We're also talking to these artists and see what they want and try to make the interface easier for them to use. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next question is for Zach. 
Uh, regarding the legged robots, Simon wrote about the environment as being the thing that causes complex interaction, even from a simple system. How are you thinking about incorporating analysis of the environment into your control systems? Yeah, so there's that's a big, big one. Um, so the, there's a, a line of work that, that we've been kind of going down for the last couple of years, which is how to um, how to really rigorously handle contact interactions in um, in these kind of control algorithms. And what I mean by that is, uh, like for like a robot, you know, your foot comes off the ground, hits the ground, you have an impact event, and you have uh, friction. All of these effects. Not only are they you know hard to model and non-linear, they're actually non-smooth, right? So an impact event, you're either touching or you're not. So there's this kind of binary combinatorial flavor to those contact interactions. Um, so we've been uh, digging into that problem uh, in, a, in a really trying to, from a first principles like physics kind of kind of perspective, to try to figure out how to capture those um, in ways that are uh, tractable. So if you just care about making a simulator, you can do that, right? But if you care about um, having a controller that can reason about these things and kind of predict into the future and and sort of optimize contr control inputs uh, with those predictions, it, it gets a lot harder because you need to then worry about you know can you get gradients of these things if if you're if it has this binary non-smooth flavor. So so that's one area we've done a ton of work uh, and we're continuing and we, we've made some some recent progress that hopefully uh, will will be out soon uh, and then. Um, uh, a very closely related uh, area that we haven't really dug into yet, but I have a proposal that I just submitted today on this, uh, is, is trying to figure out how to incorporate perception into this stuff. Uh, so, you know, if you're in this, you know, the mountain goat scenario, right, you're on the on this cliff edge uh, face, you've got like, it's you know, super rough terrain, you have to figure out where to put your feet and um, different, you know, friction on different surfaces and all this stuff. How do you actually fuse that in uh, online? And, and that's a super hard problem. Uh, we have some ideas. I don't want to sort of, you know, throw those out yet. They're sort of half baked, and we haven't really tried any of them yet. But that's yeah, it's another area. Uh, so those are kind of the two big things. One is just how do you reason through contact things and, and interactions with the environment and the physics of it, and the other is how do you fuse perception into the, everything. I once read an article on the mountain goats that said that they uh, very largely used established paths rather than actually covering new ground. So there's probably something in that space too to yeah. think about. I mean, it doesn't doesn't work for these uh, rovers that are exploring something, a terrain that we truly don't understand. But uh, but maybe, maybe once we've explored a little bit more, there'll be some paths that we want to follow. And yeah, for sure. Local exploration. Make some of that planning a little easier. Uh, let's see, we have a question for Jin Young. Uh, what opportunities do you see to collaborate with the School of Art at CMU? And if you want to punt at this one because nobody's been on campus yet, uh, I think that's perfectly reasonable. But uh, my career has been defined by some really wonderful collaborations with the School of Art. So I can assure you that they do, the possibility does exist. Uh, so, but you may not have had a chance to execute on it yet. Do you have any thoughts for this question? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think uh, d during my like second visit to where I'm choosing different school, I was actually talking to uh, Golden Levin uh, in that school of art for one or two hours. So he, he showed me some demos. We are looking for, forward to working uh, with his students and also other faculties. And uh, and uh, so I think there are lots of opportunities. I talked to many uh, like artists around the world. They are all big fan of kind of the things that are inspired by uh, Gary Levin's work. And and we as well we are we are looking to work with with him uh, as with other faculties. Uh, I, I haven't had a chance because due to COVID, it's it's hard to collaborate. Uh, but hopefully, there are more opportunities in in the future. That's so the one thing I would like to work on is can we build some kind of easy to use software and APIs for, for artists. Maybe they have a different kind of requirements. Uh, so can, can we have, have kind of most widely used tools, for deep learning tools for artists? Oh, that's one opportunity. The other one is can we, uh, maybe can we teach a course a cross tested between the School of Art and uh, CS, uh, CS. Uh, maybe we, we, we can sort deep learning for art, it's kind of these kind of give some lectures. So so in my current course already a couple of students are from School of Architecture and uh, Mechanical Engineering, they are interested in applying this kind of technology in their 
in their design. So but maybe we can have a course just for for even a more broader audience in the future. And yeah. Yeah, I think it would be really interesting to do something uh, of that nature with the IDA program as well, which is one of the one of the unique elements of CMU is this program that brings together people from both sides of campus and uh, in some really interesting courses. So we should definitely, once everything's back someplace approaching yeah. formal, yeah. uh, we should definitely be able to, to do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a question which uh, applies equally to both of you. So what's your favorite thing about working for CMU so far? You want to start with that, Virginia, since you're already talking? Yes, I think one thing I, I like about CMU is uh, there are just uh, so many faculty who are experts on different things. So you can always find, uh, you don't have to send an email to a professor in a different university. You can always find uh, resources if you don't know something and you want to get help uh, from a particular topic. Uh, so that, that that's the one thing I really like about CMU is you can find a world experts in any kind of area uh, just within the university, yeah, and ask ask help, yeah, for, from them, yeah. And they are all were very willing to help, yeah, yeah cool. And Zach? So I have a couple. Uh, yeah, so like, I, I would say having not been on campus, you know, uh, except for, you know, twice maybe uh, since I've been here, I found though that there's a, kind of a, a super strong sense of community, especially among, uh, among RI. I found that um, you know, in spite of everything being remote, um, there's yeah, the, the community is really strong and, and people are, are really fantastic. Um, so so that's been great. And uh, the the other thing is, in spite of not having been able to take advantage of it yet, um, I'm I'm part of the Field Robotics Center, and I've walked through there a couple times, and it's like the ultimate robot playground. It's it's awesome. So those are those are two things, I guess. But those are my two favorite things. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, I think back to what my first days on campus were like. It's just so completely different than what, unfortunately, what the two of you are experiencing. But we are a great community. We do have a lot of experts in uh, in a lot of different areas. So we'll get there. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? It looks like the queue is currently empty. All right. Anything that either of you would uh, want to share that we didn't have a chance to get to? We made you speculate about the future. We asked you uh, some questions about your research. Uh, anything we we didn't cover? Are you looking? Are either of you looking for students? Are you uh, full up already? What's 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 going on in sort of building your labs? Maybe that would be something good to talk about. Yeah, I brought a couple of students with me who were uh, willing to move from sunny California to to Pittsburgh. Um, so that was uh, that was that was great, um, and and it actually uh, you know it took it didn't take that much convincing actually uh, in a couple of these cases. Uh, the other the other one who I tried to bring uh, ended up taking a job at SpaceX. So what are you gonna do? Uh, but uh, so and then I've I've recruited uh, a couple of new students this this past fall as well. Um, so we're, we're slowly getting into it, and um, yeah, really looking forward to getting some hardware going. Yeah. I mean, yeah, is there any possibility of, uh, of building kits and getting them out to undergrads or, you know, something that's yeah. great that still works in this? I mean, I think it is possible. It's, it's the sort of thing where if we had already had the kits debugged, you know, before this all happened, I think it could have been, you know, a, a doable thing. I think right now I just don't have the bandwidth to do it. So it's, it, I feel like that's a good summer project. Like yeah. we could probably get those kind of kits together this summer when we don't have a launch deadline hanging over us. <laughs> Last summer we were building these three that, that flew um, and, uh, and everyone was kind of scrambling to get that ready. But yeah, that's definitely, that's the aspirational goal. Um, if, if we hadn't been you know, locked down and everything, we, we might've gotten there. We, we actually um, advertised this whole, uh, it's called PyCube, our, our open source uh, avionics stack. Um, and we, we advertised those last year at the small satellite conference, which is kind of the, the big conference for, for this kind of stuff, small satellite stuff, and got huge, huge interest from all, all kinds of schools who, and, and um, the idea there was that we were actually gonna do a fab run 
and and sort of send these out to to people in sort of a crowdfunded. Uh, and we we got um, over three hundred uh, orders logged for for the the hardware to, to send out to to other schools. So we're we're still working on that. And there's there is yeah there's definitely the dream is to have a, a kit and you know well documented and all this and, and ship these to people. We just haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, Working well, on maybe it. you need to teach a course as a debugging run for building that kit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um, so I was doing that last spring, actually, and yeah. the course got interrupted halfway through because of the lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. It was the student who's like doing the kits and built the three CubeSats was the TA for the course. And like we were kind of doing this all as part of a class, and it kind of all fell apart. Right. Yeah, there were some courses that were easy to take quickly remote than, and others that were a whole lot more difficult. That was certainly on the more difficult end of things. Uh, Julian, how, how's it going in building your lab and your group? Uh, yeah, it's, I think it's pretty smooth. We have um, two PhD students and two math students now. So it's kind of, uh, it's at least a size you can have a group meeting or like you know, have some social hours. So we have a weekly social hour, weekly group meeting. Uh, in a social hour, we play this kind of game called kind of job battle. Is you the one player is uh, joy, uh, you give a give a word, and one player is trying to join it, join it, and the other one is guessing. So we need four players. So we already have four players. Uh, so I think actually more people come to the social hour than the group meeting sometimes. Uh, so I think it's plenty of fun, and we are also looking for how more students uh, this year. So I think last year we actually. So I actually tried to have two students and they, they both got offers from all the places like top four schools and we, we, we get one and I, I, lo I lost, lost the other one. But the, the funny thing is the other student who decided to stay at Stanford, but then somehow he, he reached out to me again. He's tried to, we are, we are collaborating with his advisors, her advisor at Stanford on, on some projects. So you never know like how, how, how I think kids nowadays try to work with two faculty from different universities. They are not look, only looking for code advisorship, they're looking at cross university code advisorship. Yeah, cool. Yeah. I mean, that actually, it actually points to another question that maybe we could talk about. You know, there are some, actually some advantages to the situation that we're currently in. Uh, in the graphics lab meetings, we've been inviting students from other universities to come talk. And, you know, that's something we never would have done because you can't fly them around. Uh, but now that it's all Zoom, we might as well. Uh, are there any tricks or uh, good things about, about the lockdown that, that either of you have found? I guess in my case, uh, having, having moved and sort of had uh, I have a bunch of students who are kind of in limbo and I'm co-advising several students who are still at Stanford and stuff like this. And it's, um, uh, you know, and, and that started, you know, the remote thing started before I moved and, and then I moved over the summer. So it actually made it so that there was a lot less transitional stuff because we were already doing everything remotely. So um, in some sense, moving, you know, during the pandemic in terms of my, you know, work life was, was actually probably easier because uh, everything was remote anyway. So I, yeah, that, um, so I run my group meetings now and half the people are in California and like you know, a couple of people in Pittsburgh and some people are living at home and that doesn't really matter. So yeah, that's sort of been, it's been interesting. It's not as nice as having everybody in the same room, but given the circumstances, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of it's good, I guess. Yeah, well, you wouldn't have had everybody in the same room anyway since. <laughs> right, right. But, I mean, uh, yeah, you just have the time zones to deal with. Anything occur to you in this space? Any upsides to this situation? Um, I think there are two upsides. One is uh, actually it might be easier to also to collaborate remotely. So I collaborate with folks at MIT and Stanford and Berkeley. So all, all of them, because it's easier to add a collaborator if we are working remotely anyway. Uh, students are maybe in a different city anyway. So it's easier to collaborate and also uh, the other good thing for me is I, I don't need to drive to, to, to campus and I don't, I don't need to deal with the snow. Uh, so I, yeah, I used to work at MIT. I have to uh, like clear the snow and drive to the campus every day. And yeah, so it's good because kind of, but I kind of missed outdoor activities as well. So there are pros and cons, but it's definitely easier for collaboration or, or for giving talks to other, other places. It's also quite easy. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, we could measure this, I guess. We could see if uh, more papers come out with more institutions on them over the next year or so than, uh, than would have been true in the past. It's interesting. Okay, well, uh, if there are no other questions, and it looks like there aren't, uh, then I would like to thank both of our panelists. I, uh, I have a lot of respect for your ability to be cheerful and get things going under adverse circumstances. So uh, it'll be nice to, nice to see you in person in faculty meetings at some point, but, uh, but it sounds like things are going really well. And uh, you obviously have incredibly uh, interesting and, and very strong research programs. So it's, uh, it's good to see that there's a way to make progress on those even, even in the pandemic. So thank you both very much for coming to this uh, meet and greet meeting. And it was fun to talk to you. And thank you to the audience for your questions. Likewise, thanks, thanks a lot for taking the time.